Hello again. Um, this is me, Colin, uh, recording for Chicago Reacts. Uh, today I'm going to be watching Timothy Dexter, The Dumbest Rags to Richest Story by uh, Sam Onella. Um, again, if you haven't already, please, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, also, again, this is my second official video um so I i'm new to the channel new to doing this in general so please um be kind um have some patience i'm learning i'll probably be annoying at first i, I don't know let's not talk down on myself uh or so early anywho um yeah i'm i'm excited to, to learn this uh the dumbest rags to riches story i sure as hell hope that one day on my grave it will say, Colin lived this date to 2025. Uh, dumbest rags to riches story <laughs> ever. But he, he got it. He got his riches. Um, that's going to be me one day. So let's see if my rags to riches story will be quite as dumb as this rags to riches story. Without further ado, here we go. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey kids, now we all know that fate is a fickle thing. Some of mm. us may try to defy its will, but there's enough small businesses with Pizza Hut roofs out there to tell you that such a thing is ultimately futile. As for most of us, we tend to have our fair share of good and bad luck throughout our lives, but every now and then, RN Jesus smiles upon some drooling little loaf child and says, You, my son, you shall be the one with all the figgy pudding. That child was Timothy Dexter. Dexter was born in Malden, Massachusetts oh in 1747. He he had a humble upbringing, dropping out of school as an eight-year-old to work as a farmhand and a leather worker. But Dexter thought he deserved better, so when he grew up, he married one Elizabeth Frothing Ham, a rich widow in need of company. Frothing Ham. Mm. Yeah. You know you want to get with Frothing Ham. Don't lie. Gold digging achieved, he began his quest to become a true aristocrat. As his first step, he thinks, hmm, all the rich guys I know are in positions of power. I should run for office. Now, the town of Malden wasn't much keen on appointing a bumbling second grade dropout, but after rejecting dozens of petitions sent in by Dexter, they eventually gave up and decided to just make some shit up, leading to Dexter becoming the official informer of deer, tasking him with keeping logs on the local deer population. And over statistics of does and bucks alike, Dexter ruled in with an iron Informer of deer, holy shit. Shit. had already known that there weren't any deer in Malden, Massachusetts. Satisfied with his political career, Dexter then <laughs> set his sights on greater financial ventures. So a little history, in 1775, as part of our growing independence from Britain, the Continental Congress decided to establish their own currency, known as the Continental Dollar, real creative there. Then the Revolutionary War started, and it dawned on people that these pieces of paper wouldn't be- Hey, was that supposed to be the 13 colonies against the- I, I, I recognized, uh, the UK. Is that the 13? I, I guess so. 13 colonies right there. Real creative there. Then the Revolutionary War started, and it dawned on people that these pieces of paper wouldn't be very useful in a giant pile of wet tea and smoldering patriots, causing their value to do one of those horny eagle death spirals. Then the Congress did, you know, that stupid thing that every high schooler learns is stupid, not invading Russia in winter but the other one, practically making them worth less than their weight in paper and ink. And wouldn't you know it, a good portion of the Continental Army was paid with these, so by the time the war ended, many veterans were left totally destitute. The aristocrats mm. were like, well, these grass-eating untermenches did kind of give us a country, so whatever, we'll throw them a few cents and take this trash off their hands. Dexter was like, ooh, ooh, I'm a wealthman, I I'm gonna do that too. And he spent the majority of his savings buying a boatload after boatload of the 1780s equivalent of blockbuster gift cards. By all accounts, this should have been his ruin, but by some stroke of luck, after the Constitution was ratified, the new government decided that they'd trade Continentals for treasury bonds worth 1% of their face value. Doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind, Dexter bought thousands of crates of bills for free fractions of pennies apiece. So as buybacks began across the country, his stockpile appreciated massively in value. And this informer of deer realized that, for the first time, there were a lot of bucks in Malden. But just because he was now- 
Okay. Um. So if if they were already, I guess, worthless, and he was buying them at pennies to the dollar, I I don't know. I, I, I'm just going off of the visuals of the cartoon um, and those piles of money, but he must have purchased loads and loads, like warehouses full of those worthless paper dollar bills. It's like Monopoly money, basically, for it to to have suddenly become worth something and and actually get a profit from it. Uh, Oh, I... I'm too dumb to understand how that works, I'll be honest. Now a man of the upper crust doesn't mean he let it go to his head. Sure, he might have purchased the most luxurious chateau that money could buy through daily Playboy Mansion-style ragers and commissioned over 40 statues of America's greatest heroes, one of which was of himself, with a plaque calling him, quote, the greatest philosopher in the Western world, Despite his incredibly tacky displays of wealth, his contemptuous contemporary still saw him for the loud, illiterate rube he was. So they started... I- I'm sure y'all are smart enough to understand that, but my <laughs> was not a, a reaction to that. Oh, that must be a true fact. No, it was just like a what an interesting thing to be able to do with your money to make a statue of yourself and put that quote. It's um, not unfamiliar to what some people do today. Some things never change when it comes to people with a lot of money giving him deliberately awful investment tips in order to get him to bankrupt himself. One such piece of advice was that he should ship warming pans to the Caribbean. For those of you born after 1850, a warming pan's this dish on a long pole that you fill up with hot coals to warm up your bed. Not much use in a tropical paradise. But Dexter was undeterred by such frivolous things as logic, went ahead and sent over 40,000 of them to the West Indies. When they arrived, the locals didn't really know what they were looking at and decided to use them as ladles for the sugar and molasses refineries. And by the end of it, Dexter sold every single one at a markup of nearly 80%. Frustrated that their plan backfired, the elites then told him to literally carry coal to Newcastle, which is an old idiom used to describe a pointless task based off the fact that Newcastle was one of the world's biggest producers of coal. The only idioms Dexter knew about all involved- I have never heard of that idiom before. Carry coal to Newcastle. I don't don't know. Let me know in the comments if you've ever heard that idiom before. If it's still something that's said today, Maybe in the UK? I have no idea. If you are from the UK and are watching this, uh, yeah, please, let me know. Different animals shitting in the woods. So he took their word on good faith and went along with it. But by some divine providence, by the time the shipment arrived, the Newcastle coal miners had all gone on strike, and Dexter once again cleared the entire shipment with a hefty profit. He was like, man, I am so smart. By this point, he was pretty confident in his speculation skills, so he started making seemingly far-fetched ventures all by himself. One time he had a bunch of stray cats rounded up for basically free, which sounds like herding cats, but what do I know? And he sent them to the Caribbean, where they were gobbled up en masse. Not like eaten, but purchased to deal with all the rat infestations. In another instance, he bought up just about every whale bone in Boston. And coincidentally, at the same time in France, men started wearing corsets too for some reason. Demand went way up, Dexter's laughing. Now for- Okay, uh, again, I- Obviously, I've never seen this video before, but whale bones. I know, like, um, tusks, the ivory, is- Are whale bones also considered ivory? Uh, I don't know. What do you do with whale bones? I know you can do like the blubber and the um, ambergris. That that's valuable. What do you do with uh, whale bones? Please um, let me know. I am an ignorant motherfucker. From an outside perspective, at the end of the day, Dexter was a very shrewd merchant. So at this point in my research, I was like, wait a minute, is he smart? Then I learned about his life outside of business. Dexter considered himself extremely knowledgeable on just about every topic. Key words, considered himself. For example, he once stumbled upon a guy painting a sign to go along with the newly built statue of Jefferson. And when he saw that the sign called Jefferson the writer of the Declaration of Independence, Dexter lost his freaking mind and insisted that Jefferson did not pen the DOI, but rather 
author the Constitution. Spoiler alert, not remotely true, he was in France at the time. An easy mistake to make today, sure, but this was only like 10 years after the fact. That's like someone today saying, Obama didn't kill Bin Laden, dumbass. That was Bill Clinton. Anyway, when the painter refused to change the inscription, Dexter started shooting at him with a long rifle until he complied. Real genteel. Dexter made sure to surround himself with the requisite number of weirdos to maintain this level of delusion, one of which was Jonathan Plummer, a man whom Dexter paid to be his poet laureate, writing only the most laudatory odes in his honor. Mind you, this wasn't just- Wait, hang on a second, I, I didn't quite catch that. I was expecting- and I don't know what I was expecting, but I just want to read what that quote was. Uh, there once was a man from Malden who thought that his wiener was Balden. He got some Rogaine and grew such a mane that when on the can, it would fall in. Maybe I, I, maybe I didn't read it with the right cadence, but that kind of, that kind of fell flat. I, or maybe it's just me. Uh, I'm not gonna try it again. Most laudatory odes in his honor. Mind you, this wasn't just your run-of-the-mill wise and wizened wordsmith. Jonathan sold fish for a living and porn. He just kind of went along with the whole thing for the pocket change. Besides his entourage, Dexter occasionally spent time with the total geeds known as his family. He had two children, whom the New England Historical Society describes as a half-mad drunk and a completely mad drunk, respectively. And he couldn't stand his wife on account of her perceived constant nagging, to the point where he would tell guests he was unmarried and that he just had a ghost in his house. Just like, oh yeah, that's a sea hag. You know, mansion built on some old Indian shipwreck or something. Timmy, please, I'm cold and my hands a rheumatic. Find it in your heart to light the fireplace for me? Yeah, plenty of that in hell, you banshee bitch. One day, in a massive stroke of ego, Wait, Dexter- If he actually just pretended that- what, did he say his wife? Or just- My- and I need to rewatch that part again, because it, it- seriously, if, if he- that is wild, to just pretend that someone who you live with, maybe you're married to, and people will come over and you tell them no, I'm not married. Uh, my house is just haunted. Ignore her. Rheumatic. Find it in your heart to light the fireplace for me? Yeah, plenty of that in hell, you banshee bitch. One day, Ow, in a massive rough. stroke That's of ego, rough, Dexter man. decided to fake his own death, complete with a lavish funeral service, just to see who would show up. Lucky for him, about 3,000 people from all walks of life turned up. Though initially staying out of sight, he soon noticed that his wife wasn't crying. So in response, he jumped out and started hitting her upside the head with a cane in front of everybody. Oh, but gee, I wonder why closer, she wasn't Dexter crying. He needed a legacy and decided to pen his memoirs, titled a Pickle for the Knowing Ones, which was basically just 20 pages of unhinged ranting about politics, religion, his wife, and whatever else came to mind. No punctuation. Random capitalization. The most amazing spelling I've ever seen. Here's some excerpts. George Washington. Attitude. Philosopher. Tobacco. General. And this is all just from the first few lines. Okay. Um, full disclosure. I, um, I am an actor. I have two degrees in acting it hasn't uh come to much but anywho i am familiar with uh like the shakespearean english uh writing of that period i have never never come across a word like general that totally nixed the the vowel I, I can maybe understand the, the J, the J-N, though, like, without any kind of vowel. Uh, that makes no sense to me. That is, this man is dumb. The entire book is written like this. And just like everything else the guy did, the thing sold like fucking hotcakes. Why does anybody even try? The best part is that when he got complaints about the total lack of grammatical anything, in the second edition of the book, he put an extra page at the end full of nothing but punctuation marks, with a little note saying that anyone who felt like whining could just stick them wherever they wanted. Dexter died in 1806, and by and large, he probably should have ended up in Davy Jones's locker. But given the circumstances, I imagine the big man upstairs dropped his big deck of mortal soul trade cards at just the right moment, letting him slip through the pearly gates undetected. And legend has it that to this day, if you pray to the name Timothy Dexter, he'll look upon you kindly and share his skills with you all. Wait a minute. Share. Skill. <gasps> Skillshare is an online learning community. We're not being paid by this brand. Um, for this, I'm going to assume the video's over.
<laughs> um, well, that was interesting. Um, this Timothy Dexter person sounds like a real douche. Um, I mean, if I could also stumble upon dumbishly uh, upon a great sum of wealth. Yeah, I, I would say no. Or I would not. I would not. I want to be very clear. I would not say no to a random stumbling upon of a great pile of wealth. I would not say no. Uh, but other than that, the video was very uh, entertaining and interesting. Um, but yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound unfamiliar to... I don't know, some of these other rich people out here that you see on social media, in the general media. Um, I don't want to name names, but, you know, other people who might own other um, major social platforms and um, have their hands in other projects with space and cars and whatnot. Anywho, um, yeah. Uh, very interesting video. Salmonella, you know, of the videos I've seen so far, again, knocked out of the park. He's he's very funny. Again, I can't remember if it was <laughs> this video or uh, the first video I did, uh, but I truly am very curious as to who does the drawings, um, the animation, whatnot for for this. It's it's very it's very internet esque, like early internet. YouTube-esque uh, style uh, from what I'm taking from it. Anywho, um, but again, if you if you uh, enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe. If you want to see more content like this video, like it. Um, I, I hope that you uh, continue to stick around and uh, follow my uh, progression into this uh, field. Uh, again, I'm very new and learning a lot along the way. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, may, maybe next time I'll, I'll have had a little bit less uh, whiskey. Uh, anywho, um, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Hope you enjoyed. Um, here's the patrons. And thanks again to all the patrons for making this happen. Here they are.